It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. On April 9, 1945, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed by the Nazi regime in Germany, just two weeks before Allied forces liberated the camp where he was hanged. Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor and theologian. Leading up to his death at the age of 44, Bonhoeffer spent two years held captive in Tegel prison due to his role in the German resistance movement. During his time in prison, he wrote a number of letters to friends and loved ones, which were gathered together after his death, published in a book called Letters and Papers from Prison. This book touched on pressing questions about the place of Christianity in an increasingly secular world, and it established Bonhoeffer as one of the leading Protestant thinkers of the 20th century. In this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast, award-winning scholar Martin E. Marty joins me to talk about the biography he wrote on Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book series. What does it mean to be a Christian in a world come of age? It's Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. And please take a moment to rate and review this show on iTunes to help grow our audience. Martin Marty, thanks for joining me today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. I appreciate you taking the time to join me. Glad to be a part of this podcast. We're talking today about the biography that you wrote in Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Books series. It's uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison. This is a book that kind of stands out in the series because it's not a book of scripture. Uh, It's a collection of letters that were put together after the death of the man who wrote them. And it's a striking collection because it candidly shows this Christian theologian wrestling with real-life situations. Uh, how would you describe Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison? What, what is this book? Most of the way, the author didn't know he was writing a book. He was sending letters to a variety of people, including his own best friend who became the editor of these. Uh, these were letters sent out of prison at the last years of Hitler and uh, smuggled out sometimes and sometimes buried in gardens and everything had to be put together that way. But I've always been interested in prison literature because I think it reveals something about the author and the times that you don't get otherwise. And I had a friend who's writing a big a book about it and uh, I spent a lot of time with him. We just think no matter who you are, what you're about, if you're confined, it's different. I was just uh, in Selma, Alabama recently and we were reminiscing about Martin Luther King's a letter from Birmingham Jail. I don't think anything he wrote in his 12 volumes tells you more about him than that. And I think this is true of Bonhoeffer, too. What is it about those about that sort of prison letter genre that makes for such a, a lasting life? These are letters that people refer back to decades after the fact. So many things that come to you in prison. Uh, you have to summarize what your life is worth. You're maybe facing death. You have no living contact with people who know you and love you. And you're down to the basics. So they're usually spiritually deep. Uh, they're probing, as these letters are. And uh, you learn some things about the author you wouldn't have known otherwise. Now give us a glimpse at the historical context. Why was a Christian theologian in Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, why was he in prison? When was this going on? In the late Nazi years, the Protestant churches of Germany had uh, divided into the majority who, quote, just went along, just like the average minister in a church in America. They're not all prophets every day. That was the majority. But they were a majority in a place where they weren't really free in any case because Hitler monitored everything. And then you had the uh, the go-along people, uh, Deutsche Christen, which was a movement that was more Hitlerian than Hitler. You know, they said that's what Jesus had in mind all along. And then you had a small resistance group, and that was a really dangerous thing to do and to be. Bonhoeffer, for example, uh, as a young theological professor, was really ruled out from teaching in the official. Remember, in Germany at that time, it's the state church. Your pastors are state employees. They get the salary from it. They build your churches. And the Nazis put them all out. And Bonhoeffer and some young men, they were all men at the time, were at a, a farm near the Baltic Sea where he taught what became, I think, his greatest book, The Cost of Discipleship. It's based on the Sermon on the Mount, and it's used by Christians and some others everywhere today. But now it's, uh, the reason he's in jail is because he became a part of the resistance, and uh, he actually was a 
deployed in the Abwehr, which would be like the CIA, which made it possible for him to be doing some traveling. He gets to Sweden and Switzerland to do some smuggling. But uh, one day his his name was on too many documents that gave the story away, and he knew he'd be arrested, and he was. And he spent the last year and a half or two of his life in two different prisons. We'll talk more about the content of the letters a little bit later on, but I also wanted to point out at the top that uh, a lot of the letters are addressed to uh, his brother-in-law. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that relationship and how those letters were going back and forth, given that uh, Bonhoeffer was in prison and, you know, under pretty strict conditions. And so how those letters were being passed around and who he was writing to mainly. Well, Bonhoeffer had a twin named Sabine, who was married to a Jewish lawyer, and they took refuge in London. Uh, Bonhoeffer spent a year as a pastor in London, uh, trying to find his footing somewhere. So some of the letters went to her. Some went to his very young fiancée, a kind of aristocratic young woman who uh, later on lived in the United States, died only a few years ago. And uh, he was 23 years older than she, He'd never had time for a love life, <laughs> but uh, some were to her. Uh, most of them were to family members, very fond letters to his parents, trying to reassure them along the way. But later on, uh, the letters mainly to make, uh, began to be theological reflections. He was writing a novel. He was uh, writing an outline for a book that he was going to do. Um, and all these things were coming about in the middle of it. But the theological turn grew more and more intense as he got near the end, and he was finally taken to another prison and executed just a few days before Hitler's death and the end of the war. And after that, um, Eberhard Bethke was the one who took those letters and put them together, began circulating them, and it became this book. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Bethke, though. Um, he was also – was he involved with the clandestine seminary that uh, that Bonhoeffer was involved with? And talk about the idea of the confessing church that they talked about back and forth with each other. Right. The confessing church that they talked about was where you had to make clear that you weren't part of the Deutsche Christian, you weren't pro Hitler or whatever. And the German churches all the way back to the time of the 16th century Reformation – would take a document called confession. Nowadays, confession means something different to most people. It means you're stating what your faith really is about. Um, the greatest theologian of the age was a Swiss man named Karl Barth, and he led a, a thing called the Barman Declaration. Um, but Barth could kind of commute back to Switzerland. Uh, Baker spent some time in S Switzerland, too, on a for uh, short trips there. But Bonhoeffer's destiny was Germany. He was in the U.S. twice, once as a young student, and then friends in Chicago lined him up to teach at Elmhurst College, and he came, and uh, Hitler was really big then, and Bonhoeffer says in a very eloquent letter, I have to go back. I will have no right to stand with my people if I have not shared their sufferings. And he had to know what was ahead. But he left behind and, uh, the best friend, and the American experience was a black pastor, when very few whites knew black pastors. He always had that outreach to others, but uh, everything was narrowing it through the whole period of these letters. Now he, he's in jail and he has to know pretty well what's ahead of him. Sometimes he would dream of uh, the war ending soon. He would uh, picture maybe getting free someday. He had to write in language of hope. But uh, as you look from a distance, you have to know that he knew pretty dark times ahead. How old was he at about at the time? Well, he was born in 1906, and this is 1944. And he was executed in 1945. And in fact, uh, when this episode appears, it will be uh, around the 70th anniversary of his execution. Um, yes. When he was in prison, he's writing these letters, and you know he he was being scrutinized. So how did he manage to get these letters sent? Uh, especially considering that he was sending them to kind of a co-conspirator. Okay. Well, uh, first thing you have to remember is that Bonhoeffer was from a, not aristocratic, but a well-off, upper bourgeois, very well-off uh, family. His father was the, I think a lot of people say the top psychiatrist in Germany at the time when psychiatry was just coming to be a big thing. They lived in a nice suburb. They had a lot of connections. They, they knew everybody along the way. And uh, Bonhoeffer also had the kind of personality that uh, one in favor in prison. A couple of guards would take a little risk on smuggling things out. 
not all his letters were illegal and, and, uh, and they could be sent rather formally. So he'd have a visitor and send them along. But he, he learned later on if there was anything in there that would incriminate anybody, he had to be sure he knew they were all censored and he had to be careful. So a lot of these then were compiled by Beth Gay. How did he go about gathering and editing these? Because not all of the letters from Bonhoeffer survived. Not all of the letters from Bonhoeffer survived. And one of the things that uh, Beth Gay, who Mike came to know, um, felt guilty about is that uh, in a precautionary moment, he burned some letters. And he thinks those letters might have revealed a great deal of where Bonhoeffer was heading in his final theology. But we wouldn't have much of anything without Beitke. And everyone trusted Beitke. He knew all the Bonhoeffers. And if there were letters out there, he got to collect them and did. And in effect, he just made the formalization of the Bonhoeffer lore his life work. He was a very capable theologian on his own. And he wrote uh, a good book, some good, many good writings. But uh, he really saw the genius of Bonhoeffer. And anything he could do to put letters together, he did. Some of these letters had been sent to ecumenical leaders. The modern ecumenical movement was just being formed then. And the World Council of Churches uh, had formed, but the people who made it, were, they knew each other. Particularly a, a Bishop Bell of England that uh, often served as a buffer and a uh, a communicator. And Baker just dug, dug up everything he could from everywhere. And I think uh, almost anything that could be found, he found. So you say that Letters and Papers is in many ways an accidental book, because as you said earlier, Bonhoeffer wasn't writing these letters necessarily for a book. I, it, it seemed like sometimes he was aware that the letters might be read by more people than those who was just sending it to. But, uh, you know, he, it doesn't seem that he ever anticipated the sort of book that it, that it ended up being produced here. So... Um, talk about the first edition, how it was born around, uh, I believe, in the early 1950s when Bethke, after he'd collected these, even as he was collecting them, I, I'm not sure he knew for sure that this would become this book that would then explode in popularity. Yeah. Well, but the time came when he could put together all the reliable things. A few things have been added later editions through the years, but he knew how to put it together. And he put, uh, they, they called it Wiederstand und Ergebung, uh, Resistance and Submission. I was a seminarian in those years, uh, in a Lutheran seminary in America, and it was kind of the uh, badge of honor or distinction for our brightest people to go to Germany and Scandinavia to catch up on the theology there that had been suppressed under Hitler. And uh, one of them came back and said, you got to read this. Peter Schneider gave him. I still have the little German edition he gave me. So I got a little head start on that. Uh, but then, thanks to movements in England and elsewhere, different people picked it up and uh, started their comments on it, spread worldwide. And Baker lived long enough, of course, to be sure that it was all done classically and regularly. Yeah. How did the work of compilation compare to other scholarship at the time, especially by German authors or in the humanities? Was it unusual for a compilation like this to be compiled? And, and how about his editing uh, decisions and things like that? Was it pretty comparable to other work or was this an unusual book? I think uh, on one level, it's, it's like all the others. You gather everything you can. You uh, be sure you get the best possible uh, editing of it all. And you put it together, and the publisher knows what it wants, and they edit you, and so on. But it's still different, too, in that most of the books, uh, I have a few other books from that period uh, of that sort. Um, a Lutheran bishop, Hans Lilje, L-I-L-J-E, who survived and lived in Hanover, uh, he did a little book of his own about it, kind of a parallel. And they're just, they're, they're numbers of collections by various people. But Bonhoeffer stood out as the one who he'd been to America twice. He was going to go to India. He uh, vicared in Barcelona and London. So he was really a world citizen already. And they all knew they had hot property when his stuff came along. And of course, the drama of the death itself, we know so much until almost the end led everybody to know this this we got to read let's talk more about the makeup of the letters now we talked a little bit about how uh, beth gay went about compiling them and a little about uh the logistics of passing them back and forth uh, under the conditions that bonheffer was in letters and papers have been so widely read i think in part because it's the book is almost like two books in one right on the one hand readers get glimpses at at everyday 
prison life at, at Bonhoeffer's suffering, and there's a sense of impending doom kind of as I've, I read through uh, the full text before mm-hmm. the interview. And there's this sense of, you know, there's this sadness hanging over the entire book just because we know his fate. So it talks a lot about his struggles there. So the two main themes that you identify in the book are this sort of quiet suffering revealed and then the theological themes. Let's talk about the suffering to begin with, the tone and the mood uh, of the letters. Talk about their tone and the mood. All right. On the dress jacket of the book uh, itself, we have a view very high up of a prison window. Uh, It was almost designed cruelly so that people inside couldn't see outdoors. And Bonhoeffer was a great lover of nature. He always listened for birds and so on. Um, But even to look at that picture, you kind of know uh, there's, there's death written all over it. Um, again, he had some privilege at first until they began to learn more and more about how uh, complicity was in the troubles. Um, and many of the letters were written to cheer up people on the outside, to assure them that he was all right. Uh, he led a very disciplined devotional life. He pretended that he was out, out there in the seminary teaching. He had little observances of, uh, of morning prayer and so on. And again, a, a couple of people in the prison did what they could to make his life a little more comfortable. But the more he got implicated in the uh, plot on Hitler's life, the change came very fast. Meanwhile, he'd been working on the outline of a book and so on. And uh, the later letters he tried out, he totally trusted Ebert Bedke. And he would try out on him. He said, uh, what's the kind of page, if you read it, you know, you turn a page, he says, some of the thoughts I've been having will be very disturbing to you, that, that, that. And uh, you could almost say that the early readership of the book was twofold. One was sort of the uh, pious identification with the marker, and the other was a uh, tiptoe, wow, this guy's far out. Um, and uh, a lot of his early fame in the book was that some of the most radical interpretations of his radical theology came first, and then as you read more back into it, uh, it kind of stabilized. He's he's still seen as a a radical thinker, but he wrote books on, uh, a book early on on Christology, and for him, um, Christ was always the center of things. But I think in the first half of the book, a question he asked for all of us, um, who is Christ Jesus for us today, meant one thing in normal resistance, and the other when he's trying to envision what should the Christian church be about after Hitler? Uh, yes, so there are two books in one. Let's talk a little bit more about that that first book, the one about the quiet suffering revealed. You you describe the, the letters, some of them as agonized, yearning, also often celebratory. What would a man in Bonhoeffer's position have to celebrate? Bonhoeffer had a kind of a, sounds funny to say, sunny disposition. Uh, no matter what he was going through, he would see some positive thing. In New York, he didn't like the theology he was getting at the Liberal Union Seminary, so he went to Harlem and uh, had a friend there, and went to Abyssinian Baptist Church, still a very important church along the way, and uh, he came to know them, and they came to know him. Uh, He just had that way. He had the sunny disposition that he taught young men, boys, confirmation. I've been a pastor, and I know that's not always the ideal thing to be dealing with 13, 14, 15 year olds. (laughs) Uh, But he took them on picnics and hikes and uh, charmed them in a sense. And that never disappeared. His love of music. He was almost a concert level pianist. And uh, often his illustration comes from that. And any smuggling in of of a radio sound, he could give a very intelligent comment on along the way. So that was uh, the sunny side of him, and uh, he cared greatly about his parents' suffering, so he often almost minimized uh, what it was like, but you can't get away from the fact that for a guy as buoyant as he, as traveled as he, to be confined in every move watched and every letter seen. And something I didn't mention earlier on communication, for example, he and his parents worked out a communication system. He liked big books, and they would bring in books, Plutarch's Lives, which is a long book. Well, they had a coded system uh, between him and Bateke in particular. On one page, he'd put a little dot under the letter D, and the next page, 
have a dot under an E, and the next page R, and then you have the word dare, dare de das, and he's off and running with sentences. Well, you could get uh, a couple of sentences out of a whole book that way, but he was able to keep in special contact with that. Has anybody collected those messages? That, that, that Are those still available, the ones that uh, were from those whatever, books? Whatever Bateke could get his hands on, he saw to it were, were uh, well, they're part of the book itself. Oh, they yeah. they appear there. I did I didn't notice. Um, yeah, you you wouldn't know what part was smuggled out that way. Wow, um, you mentioned the music too. That was really interesting because uh, there are little mini musical critic essays sort of sprinkled throughout that uh, they're really fascinating. It was astonishingly uh, encompassing. Um, when he would write his young fiance, she was a, a poet, and he didn't like her taste in poetry. I happen to like her taste in poetry better than yeah. She his. liked Rilke. See, like real kids, so do I. And that he, he couldn't warm to that. He liked sort of middle-class authors, Otto Birch Stifter and stuff, who wrote folk tales and so on. But in music, uh, there were a numbers of uh, church musicians at that time who are still much played. Uh, Hugo Distler, D-I-S-T-L-E-R, for example. You could still go get his music, and I get to concerts where they'll do a Hugo Distler setting. Um, he knew Baroque music very well. Uh, Bach, of course, you can't be a German Lutheran theologian and not be steeped in Bach. Um, but also, uh, if he heard a nightingale in a tree outside, that had to fit into his life, too. Uh, just a real love for beauty. There's a haunting passage um, in one of the letters where he's he writes something that he saw scratched on the wall. Uh, it's a statement that says, in a hundred years, it'll all be over. Um, why do you think he would pass that message along? Why he passed it along? Yeah. Well, I think he had a strong sense of time. I don't think he knew what it meant. Um, it'll all be over. On his up days, it meant the suffering will end and it will be way past and forgotten. And on that level, it didn't take a hundred years. Well, you never forget Hitler, but I mean, yeah, right. Not the imminence of threat. So endure, folks. We're going to want to get there. Uh, the other, the pessimistic side, he really envisioned not much of a future for the church as the church and as he and anybody knew it, even though he had ties to a place where the church was powerful. This kind of takes us right into the next theme. So we've talked about the suffering revealed element and some of the more personal elements. Now, um, there are also really theologically rich letters that are included here. And you identify the letter of April 30th, 1944, as an especially pivotal letter. Uh, you say that it, it jars the attentive reader. What is so jarring about this particular letter? How does it stand kind of as a milestone in the book? Well, he tells Baker, you, you may not understand me, but... Uh, the two main concepts that came out of that letter and the letters of that time were the concept of the world come of age, Mündige Welt, the adult world, and uh, religionless Christianity. And putting the two together is what he really saw as the future. Remember, he was pretty sour on the church that he knew because it had compromised so much. Uh, here are people who are pious at church in the morning and in the afternoon they're putting others to death. Uh, he he didn't really care for conventional piety. This seems strange too, because uh, he spoke well of and used uh, Losungen, which is the Moravian uh, prayer. The Moravians were a set of Lutherans who were put out of Salzburg by the Catholic Archbishop. Uh, they exist in our time. They're strong in Pennsylvania and around the world. And their, uh, their book on daily devotions, uh, the Martys use. And uh, in my daily communication with our large family, I send out on the web, and it always refers to that. Well, as you read it, it's far more pious than he was. I type out some of these things for my family. And just yesterday, I had one, a hymn that I would call Cornball. <laughs> I need thee every hour, every hour I need thee, dot, dot, dot. Well, if the Moravians used it, that's what he would structure his life to use it on what they had done. So in that sense, he could uh, deal with conventional piety, but he also saw conventional piety as a cover-up for evil. You go through these motions, it gives you a conscience to do bad things. And that's where he began to envision that... Uh, Yes, the Bible will survive. Interestingly, in the last weeks, he said, 
You'd be surprised how much I've been reading the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures. Well, the, that part of the Bible doesn't have in it the resurrection of Christ. Uh, it doesn't have Christ, of course, but it's written hundreds of years before. Uh, but he liked the basicness of it. Everything in that world had to turn basic. And uh, so the world had come of age. And he, he says at one place that uh, regular piety is left now only to existentially disturbed people and uh, secularized Methodists. <laughs> and he would move on beyond that. Uh, no, no more of, of that. But true devotion to the scripture, but he's probing deeper all the time to find other dimensions of it. Uh, so religionless Christianity would be look less like regular piety. And then he said the, the Mindegewelt, the people he knew out there as an educated university person, more and more they were moving beyond the Christian story. And you had to get to the basics, and for that it was, who is Jesus Christ for us today? And then he coined the phrase for it, Jesus is the man for others. Everything he read of Jesus that preserved in the Gospels was that Jesus didn't live unto himself, even when he's quoted as building a church, which is a very rare concept in the four Gospels, and it was always the church was for others. And those two words, for others, dominate his final writings. Betke called this particular letter and some of the other ones explosive as he's reading some of these things. And and Bonhoeffer seems intent on not being misunderstood, even though he, he didn't have a lot of time or space to flesh out these ideas. Because like you said earlier, they, they can appear very, very radical and they can be interpreted in a number of different ways, which we'll talk about um, in just a minute. But let's talk just a little bit more about some of the things that he put in these letters. Another example that you hadn't mentioned yet was uh, God being like a hypothesis that we must uh, live without. So he's talking about this world come of age. The social yeah. climate is such that people aren't convinced uh, by belief in God. Other people are focused on either proving or disproving God, which he wasn't really interested in because how can how does that apply to your everyday life? So uh, what did he mean by talking about God as being a hypothesis that we, speaking of Christians, must live without? Well, he says in one Latin phrase, you should live etsi um, Deus non dator, as if God uh, dator does not exist. Yeah, as even if, if there were no God, yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that he turned atheist. There was a little movement we may talk to later uh, called Christian atheism. Uh, that wasn't it. He, he uh, His very last messages to the other prisoners as he's heading to the gallows are right central. It's, it's Christ crucified. He loved the passages from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, By his stripes we are healed. Uh, the man for others is always central. So in that sense, uh, he's really trying to envision God without, without trimmings, God without uh, needing all these other enhancements, which really meant the God of the Hebrew scriptures, which was in the midst of the life of a people, and the God of the four Gospels and the writings of Paul. One of the excerpts that you quote in the book here is talking about this. Bonhoeffer writes, God consents to be pushed out of the world and onto the cross. God is weak and powerless in the world, and in precisely this way, and only so, is at our side and helps us. Matthew 8.17 makes it quite clear that Christ helps us not by virtue of his omnipotence, but rather by virtue of his weakness and suffering. This is the crucial distinction between Christianity and all religions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly nailing it right. Um... And you can't get away from the fact that that is really central in the passion stories of the Gospels. Um, I think uh, in, in the letter of Paul to a congregation of Philippi, uh, that meant a lot to Bonhoeffer too, that uh, Jesus Christ was uh, equal with God, but he didn't consider equality with God something that he had to hold on to. So he emptied himself, the Greek word kenosis, uh, and emptying. He, he did without it. He could have uh, called down legions of angels, the Gospels say, but he didn't. Uh, he took on the world's sufferings, and so he had to suffer. He emptied himself, took the form of a servant, and uh, met death on the cross. 
And that really was the Jesus that, that inspired Bonhoeffer and led him into the theology he was going. Now, he, he didn't leave everything behind, but he taught his students, later on his readers, that you can't rely on the earthly power that the church once had. As far as he was concerned, to the degree that the church had power, it was corrupt. It was corrupt when Constantine uh, named the civilization. Uh, we call it Constantinian Christianity, which was born around 325 and died in uh, Philadelphia in 1787. <laughs> the Constitution. Uh, he was always worried about power and pomp. He'd seen uh, Hitler immediately appointed a, a bishop, right? Bishop Mueller, who used the cross and the swastika together. And that had to be done without. So that was, you, you have to learn to live as, as if God did not exist, or, is not, is, or if God is not a given, is probably a better way to put it. And, and yet, and then he returns to all of it. It's almost as if you have to shrug something off in order to find the core of what had been there. But the Jesus of all the Bonhoeffers, always in his two lectures, it became a book called Christology. Uh, this is always long before prison days. Uh, the Jesus he talked about and worshipped. So Bonhoeffer's Jesus, as you said, was the man for others, um, the one who uh, kind of empties himself of godhood and joins humans here in suffering uh, alongside them on the cross. Did he recognize this as being the primary Christology, or did he recognize the fact that Christianity has inspired a number of different Christologies that might be appropriate for different periods of time? Do you, do you get a sense for what he thought about that? Well, he, he was a pretty sophisticated uh, church historian along the way as a theologian, and so he knew well how the creeds got put together in the first round, and uh, he knew very much the uh, Protestant Reformation, um, I'm a Lutheran, and I can't read Bonhoeffer without finding Luther all over the place. He was steeped in that, and, and Luther said an awful lot of these kinds of things. Um, <laughs> I, I went to Lutheran seminary, and I think of any line of Luther, which every seminary had on his desk was that God doesn't like feeble and weak sinners. You know, God likes strong sinners because then you have more to forgive. And he said, sin boldly, and then praise God more boldly. Well, that was a, a big part of it. You don't have to meet society's terms as to what is respectable Christianity. You had to be sure that you were with... Well, maybe the best one for me was a poem he wrote. He said in that poem in German, I'll, trans I'll translate it, uh, people go to God when they are weak because he's strong, dot, 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 dot. No, um, God is weak, and we have to go to rescue God, because God has so entered the human story in the midst of its suffering, its weakness, everything but his sin, that uh, God's in trouble. And instead of uh, putting him up there and running to him away from the world, to see where he wanted to be found, in the villages of Galilee, and on the cross, and uh, powerless. And for him, that's a big part of who is Jesus Christ for us today. Yeah, you give a translation of that poem here in the book, and you provide it in uh, German as well. Just from a aesthetic standpoint, how how are Bonhoeffer's how are his poems that he included in some of these letters? Well, he surprised everybody by the degree to which this came about. I, I know some of the translators, and uh, they're good poets. They're published as regular poetry. Uh, and it's useful for a lot of purposes. One time I was in Prague, Czech Republic, and uh, the feature there was the Bonhoeffer Conference, and the music was a cantata. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the composer now. The words were, it was called Night Thoughts at Tegel Prison. That is, he would hear people that are going to be led off to death the next day shrieking and shouting, and this composer tried to bring that all together into a coherent cantata. Uh, well, Bonhoeffer saw that, that shouting himself as as music and poetry too. But he quoted one line of Luther, uh, God is more pleased by the angry shout of the atheist than by the pious prattle of the over-believer. Uh, he pictures God getting bored when we try to convince God how pious we are. And the anger of somebody who had trusted in God and now is going to be led to the gallows, uh, to him was a more authentic praise of God 
Uh, now that's radical. He called it radical, but it has really served a lot of people. Uh, I've been to a lot of places. Uh, as I confess in the book, I'm not in the front line a a uh, bounty for a scholar. Uh, I go. I've been to their congresses and their conferences, and I'm right at home, and they like me. But uh, they know every line of him along the way. Whereas I'm a regular church historian. But if I wanted to find Bonhoeffer, I found him in South Africa. One of his uh, translators and editors is a friend now, John de Grucci, capital G R U C H Y. I better get his name in there because a little bit of Dutch South Africa. Well, he's written books on Bonhoeffer and his struggle in South Africa. Who meant most? I was in there, South Africa the summer before the Mandela breakthrough. And uh, my wife and I visited a Lutheran theologian who was in prison, was in, in under the ban, they call it. Uh, he had written a, a commentary in a letter to the Ephesians, which is about breaking down walls. And so the, uh, I guess, Nazi-like apartheid government put him in jail with six uh, pious South African bank robbers who uh, urinated on him and put their saving cream on him till he got pneumonia and they had to get him out of there and they put him at home under the ban. Well, under the ban meant you could never be in a room with more than two other people. You couldn't be quoted or anything like that. We were in his home and uh, his daughter wanted to bring us tea in mid-afternoon. Well, uh, Marty, his wife, and he, that's three people. So he had to go out while we're being served when this daughter came in. Well, we see that all the time. And what meant most to this theologian and many like him uh, was that uh, they go to God when God's in trouble because they identified God with the troubles. Uh, a year, uh, that, during that conference, I was walking along a street in uh, not Johannesburg, uh, Cape Town, with the Grucci. And we had just heard a bulletin that the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa passed a formal resolution saying, strongly under Bonhoeffer influence, we were wrong. We taught you wrong. Uh, the story in Genesis about Babel, the Tower of Babel, uh, the South African Synod, God taught that the intention was that you should be separate development, black, white, everything. No, we taught you wrong. And Degushi turned to me and said, Marty, the government doesn't know it, but it just fell today. Uh, it fell because it couldn't handle this kind of power. Uh, another Bonhoeffer figure in South Africa, people always ask me, of all the people you've ever met, who impressed you most? Was a South African Dutch Reformed the uh, theologian, Pastor Bayers Naude, N-A-U-D-E. Um, we got to meet him, and I read him. And I never met anybody like him, who uh, reading things like this, went to a conference in the Netherlands. He was the top pastor in South Africa. He might have become prime minister someday. And uh, these writings really got to him. And he just said, he talked to his wife and said, can you walk with me? And he announced this packed church. From now on, I'm going to be on the side of the blacks. He formed a group for that. And you could see his congregation fighting past. Not one of them turned toward it. Hundreds of people. Well, what's the stain to him? The God up there? No, the God he could identify with. And uh, I don't think any theologian meant more to the South Africans than that. And I ran into the same thing in Colombia. Um, everywhere you went, you'd find some people, not cultic Bonhoeffer people. There's some people who study him so much that they're more Bonhoeffer. Gone. But the kind of people Bonhoeffer liked were just plunged into life as it was. Uh, the grocer, the meat market, the accountant, they were as important as the theologians. That's Martin Marty. He's the author of a biography of Letters and Papers from Prison by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He joins me today from Chicago on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Marty, from what you're describing, it seems like Bonhoeffer, you know, obviously he was heavily Protestant, right? So the irony is that Protestantism provides all the grounds for critique of its own culture because it was built as a critique of Catholicism. Uh, it laid the groundwork for future critique of itself, and Bonhoeffer seems to fit well within that tradition then, as he's turning the lens of critique 
the Christian critique back on the church itself. You recently wrote a blog post about the idea of connected criticism. Uh, you were writing it uh, about American exceptionalism and this idea that I believe it was in response to accusations that the president of the United States doesn't love the United States. And so um, you talk about the idea of connected criticism, and it reminded me a bit of Bonhoeffer and his relationship perhaps to uh, Christianity. So I wanted to hear a bit more from you on that idea of what connected criticism is and how it relates to Bonhoeffer's experience. Well, let me introduce, at this point, a version of the word paradox with which he lived. We learned a lot of this from Paul Tilly. We defined the church. It had to have uh, the, the Protestant principle of prophetic protest and Catholic substance chant and uh, literature and all that goes with it. Um, one of uh, Martin Luther's main themes was that the individual is simul simultaneously. Simul justus et peccator. He is at the same time justified and a sinner. When God looks at Bonhoeffer in Christ, God sees uh, Christ, sees a saint. When God looks at Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Bonhoeffer, he sees scum of the earth. And in the plural, the same kind of thing uh, carries over, that the church had to be seen that way. Um, now, as far as a nation is concerned, the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago had a editorial by a columnist that I favor, William Galston, after the President of the United States had uh, said some critical things about the country, and he was being heaped on by people. Some of them said he's a Muslim, some of them he's a traitor, some of these, all these things. Uh, and the same speech, of course, said lavish things about America, as he did a few days later, where I heard him in, in Selma, where he knew all about the racial problem in there, and yet this is a great place to be. Well, that's, that, that carries through uh, throughout. And how do you get credentials to speak critically? And Galston quoted uh, different figures. Michael Walzer, W-A-L-Z-E-R, contemporary sociologist. Uh, Edmund Burke, a conservative uh, British uh, figure of two centuries ago. Uh, and what to tie them all together was you connect your criticism of yourself, peccator, sinner, with the a look at the other side of the world. Uh, I try to do that throughout. And by the way, you flushed me out here today because I've been writing that column weekly for 11 years, and you will never find in it the name uh, Bush or Reagan or Clinton or, in this case, Obama. And that's a little game I play. Because if you're commenting on religion and contemporary life, a lot of people want to judge right away whose side are you on. Right. And uh, that Galston kept me from having to do uh, by taking this concept. Connected criticism. America is exceptional. I just can't get over how exceptional it is. You're in Utah and I'm in Chicago and I can look out the window. I'm on the 85th floor and I can look at one of the great cities of the world and I can go to symphonies and concerts and we have good voluntary activities, and we have uh, uh, all that there. And then I know that uh, within a few blocks from me, every night somebody is killed and bad stuff happens. Um, I can't just look at the pretty part and say that's it. I have to look at both. But I, having looked at that side, I then can say what I love. And the exceptionalism that he was criticizing and that I was criticizing uh, is, I would call it, idolatry of the nation. And not only are we uh, exceptional, we have some exceptional things, but we are unique in the world. We're the uh, alone, all alone. And I quoted Galston because he uh, uh, quoted the, the prophet Amos. The prophet just said, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. And Amos, speaking for God, says, I despise the noise of your solemn assemblies. Uh, which is the other side there, too. I think both of these are in Bonhoeffer throughout. Oh, he loved he loved uh, Bach. Oh, my. He loved the church traditions. He loved a lot of theology. He loved, loved a lot of narrative and all that. And then he could say, but look what we make of it. And look what we do to it. And uh, I think that's something we haven't yet fully learned from Bonhoeffer or the other people that call some quoting. Let's talk about the book's reception now. Um, you write that initially and locally, 
this book wasn't destined to appear to a lot of laudatory fanfare in Germany. Von Heffer was a dissenter to what people almost invariably now see as being an evil regime. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the time, there was still some discomfort about his his place because of his status as a dissenter. And did, did that impact the initial reception that his work received? This is one side of, of his Lutheran background that, uh, that we have to confront. Um, again, I'll, I'll refer one more time. I had been in the original Selma March week, and I was back, and uh, they wanted me to reminisce, and I told about driving back, uh, the man covering the, the march for Time magazine had a van, and he took five divinity props back. My quota was to find 15 people in four hours who would go to Selma. And uh, the driver said later on, I mean, the, the yeah, the driver, the Time magazine guy said, I don't know how you guys ever put one foot in front of the other. So two of you were Baptists, and you you don't have to worry about authority or anything like that. You can just protest and gleefully. He said, two of you, my dean and I, you're Lutheran, and you Lutherans are so hung up on Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, because there are no power but of God. The powers of be ordained of God, they reserve them. How did you ever do it? Well, we did it thanks to uh, Martin Luther King, because he was negotiating backstage. That's why we didn't get to finish the march that day. Uh, we thought we were protesting a law of Alabama, which we didn't give a fig about. But now it, we, we, it turns out that it had be, been federalized. Now we are resisting the U.S. government. And he said, you guys were just tied up in knots over that, but we're forgiven. <laughs> and he said, and the other person was uh, Robert C. Grant, a great New Testament scholar, very uh, Anglican high church figure, very conservative figure, but his conscience was reached by Martin Luther King, and he, he marched, and he said, yeah, two of you are ready to go, two of you are touring knots, and Robert Grant, he doesn't even know King George III is dead yet. Uh, well, that's who the clergy are trained to be in Germany. They're state employed, were. They were state employees. They get their uh, check from the church. I'm not sure. They, I'm not saying they were all sold out. They were wonderful, noble souls. But basically, you don't resist authority. And Bonhoeffer did. And I have a passage in here uh, in, in the province in which Bonhoeffer ministered and grew up. There were no Bonhoeffer churches, societies. It's as if he didn't exist. Why? Because he was not a Christian martyr. He suffered as a, a traitor to the German state. Uh, well, they all came around in due course, but that was the original perception. And uh, Von Hofer knew, therefore, that these were people that could very easily fall into, if not formal Nazism, then at least being silent in the face of evil. So that's kind of the local scene. Um, what's interesting is Von Hofer himself was aware that some of the reflections in the, the theological letters especially could be troubling to a lot of Christians, that, that they might provoke a crisis of faith or be interpreted the wrong way. There's a striking quote from one of the letters that says, anxious souls will ask what room there is left for God now. Um, mm -hmm. As the letters spread, uh, what sorts of responses did they receive? I know that Bonhoeffer was read by some as being a secularizing figure who you know, they thought he was dismissing the reality of God and replacing it with just a humanistic Jesus as a moral exemplar. Was was this a fair interpretation of Bonhoeffer? Did it get to what he was really presenting? Well, he was anything but a, but a mere humanistic Jesus. Um, interestingly, the first substantial book about Bonhoeffer was written by a Marxist theologian. This book. All of the Bonhoeffer sites were in East Germany. And... Uh, under regimes, Stalinesque regimes. Um, I know people there who were turned in by their church organists and the Stasi, their, their police were there. Uh, it was a terrible place. And the first book, therefore, was a Marxist protesting that. Hanfried Miller, von der Kirche zur Welt, From the Church to the World. A very scholarly book, but he screened out every transcendent reference. It was always man for others. Um, it has almost no followings today. It really was important in that stage. I think it, it first came to Americans' attention from radical theologians in England. Bishop John Robinson, uh, a good bishop and not a very profound theologian, 
had back trouble and read major theologians. And uh, he wrote a book, then Honest to God, in which he sort of envisioned doing away with all these transcendent references. There's no up, there's no heaven, there's no life to come or whatever. But was brought to attention among a number of Americans, many of whom stayed strongly in the life of the church, but a few of whom became the uh, Christian atheists. Only three of them became well-known, Bill Hamilton, Tom Alsizer, who is still living, and uh, Paul Van Buren. They received cover treatment in Holy Week, the Time magazine, God is dead, is God dead? Um, that was kind of a fashionable little thing, but uh, Hamilton, a very witty writer, said, we are making a creative misuse of Bonhoeffer. They took that uh, imminent side and took left the transcendent away. So that didn't last, uh, though it inspired some. And it was just enough of that that uh, Bonhoeffer became kind of a hero to oh, campus ministries. Uh, almost every campus will have Christian movements, and the young people fishing around went for some of it. But uh, overall, a uh, kind of a main line classical Bonhoeffer came which dealt a lot with his Christology and so on. And uh, you can hear that I belong to the school as the continuity between early Bonhoeffer and late Bonhoeffer because he has this paradoxical character. You can be radically radical and you can be affirmative along the way. I think that will inspire so much. Now, then he had a following among evangelicals and still does in America because if you take the whole corpus of Bonhoeffer, he's an accessible theologian. He does the main Christian themes. Uh, he really meant them, etc. And his life is exemplary. So you can get a whole literature from American conservative evangelicals. I'm not here to say they're all wrong. I'm just saying they pick the other side of him just as the radicals have picked the first side of him. But as I said, I, I, I ran into his being used in South Africa, Korea, and a big following there. And almost anywhere where people are convinced that... Um, the regime around them has been oppressive and that the church goes along too easily as a lot of our following. So there are a lot of political situations, even up to the present time, where people can see the experiences of Bonhoeffer as as a model for what they're experiencing. And, and his thought process sort of reflects the same types of concerns that they're experiencing in the present. Well, in, in, in the light of uh, where they are and what they're suffering, uh, they don't get. They don't. They don't all get a free ride reading Bonhoeffer. A Korean woman theologian has written a book on Bonhoeffer, which picks out all of his habitual patriarchalism. He wrote a homily, a sermon for his friend's marriage, and you could say it really is a confirmation of a couple of lines in the New Testament letters that say women should submit to their husband, and that her fulfillment will come that way. Well, that was very big in Germany then, and it's still big in uh, some conservative circles in America. But at the same time, numbers of the radical theologian women, uh, Dorothea Sule, S-O-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, uh, being typical, drew enough inspiration from him that they also dug out how subversive his thought was for people in a camp, in a camp when they own. So today's uh, Bonhoeffer circles are uh, as many women as men, but they had to take a different track to get there, different set of the texts. Um, he's, he's not for everybody, and not everything in him is going to talk to everybody. And each new movement as it came along had to face up to it. But again, uh, I observed that most of the time, if you were fighting off oppression or a smug church, and you get down to the basics, you deal with Jesus as the man for others. It seems like that kind of explains a little bit about why Dietrich Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison fits into the Princeton Lives of Great Religious book series, because this is a religious book that has had uh, qu quite a remarkable life in the reach that it has had, in the spread that it's had, in the different interpretations that it's generated. And that makes it similar to other texts in the series like Genesis or Job or the Bhagavad Gita, where these are texts that are generative. These are texts that um, produce... Uh, work far beyond their original context with many different types of people. And, and that seems to be the power of letters and papers from prison. Yes, it's not canonical the way uh, biblical letters are canonical, but it's classical. And I define a classic. Um, it's a book of genius 
that once it's stated and has made a gotten a hearing, you can't get behind again. I'll take a, a sample. Sigmund Freud. Almost all psychoanalysts today spend more time repudiating Freud than affirming him, but they can't get behind him. You can't get behind his language about libido or whatever. Um, Marx, Karl Marx. Yeah, there are some pure Marxists around yet, but uh, after the experience with Maoism and uh, Soviet Union and maybe Putin, who maybe not even read Marx, um, that's all a stain on it. And if you think that's all Marx is, uh, but you can't get behind him. He still gave us the words about the bourgeois and classless society, etc. And I think that's what Bonhoeffer's writing did. The man for others, religionless Christianity, and endless, endless sermons, prayers. He had the gift for the moment of bringing it all together. And so I think he's going to be read a long time from now. This biography that you've written includes a, a, quite a bit of conversation about what it means for a book to be a classic. And you just described that. It talks about... Any, any book that sparks ongoing conversation, that has many questions and, 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 and invitations, and that generates expectations, these are the types of books that become classics. And you quote from David Tracy, uh, and I'd like to read that quote here because it's, it really stands out in terms of why Bonhoeffer's book has been so potent. Tracy says, Conversation is a game with some hard rules. Say only what you mean. Say it as accurately as you can. Listen to and respect what the other says, however different or other. Be willing to correct or defend your opinions if challenged by the conversation partner. Be willing to argue if necessary, to confront if demanded, to endure necessary conflict, to change your mind if the evidence suggests it. These are merely some generic rules for questioning. As good rules, they are worth keeping in mind in case the questioning does begin to break down. In a sense, they are merely variations of the transcendental imperative elegantly articulated by uh, Bernard Lonergan, and he's a Catholic theologian, uh, and he said, be attentive, be intelligent, be responsible, be loving, and if necessary, change. <laughs> That's music to me. David Tracy is a, is a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago, trained in Rome. Many would think he's the top Catholic theologian of our decades. Uh, I had an office next to his, and I always told people whatever theology this historian was getting these years, I got by vibrations of the wall or <laughs> osmosis or capillary action or what set. We just talked all the time. And uh, he, he makes great, a great distinction between conversation and argument. And I think that is of great use in studying Bonhoeffer too. Um, argument is born of your having a knowledge or a thesis or a hypothesis, uh, but you have to defend or try to convert the other. You can't have justice without argument. You have to argue which law is better than another or so on. But when it occurs in dealing with people is, a, is the big difference. Uh, conversation is born of the question. I like to illustrate there was a time when at a certain stage, because of my love for public education, I would be speaking in communities that are torn apart in battles over vouchers. Now, I would often tell people, if I walk into that room and say, I came here tonight to talk you into accepting vouchers, in some communities, 51% of the people would listen to the rest of the speech and 49 wouldn't, or vice versa. If I come into the room and say, in this group, with all your experiences, could you come up with five good new ideas for helping American public education? It's just astonishing what any local community comes up with. Um, I think in the life of the church, too. And I think that's been a big part of what Bonhoeffer says a classic can do for you. We, what are classics? We, we, we debate uh, Dante's Divine Comedy and Milton's Paradise Lost and Goethe's Faust. Um, they're very different worlds, and yet they frame some things in such ways that we can't get away from them. And I think that uh, in the Christian church, uh, a few people in the 20th century uh, might have attained that status, but I think across the board, Bonhoeffer is a good candidate. What you and I are doing is conversing about it and not arguing about it. <laughs> 
That's right. I'm talk- I'm conversing today with Martin E. Marty. He's a professor emeritus of religious history at the University of Chicago. He's also the author of a biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison. We'll take a break and return with the conclusion of this interview. Now that you've already read all of the scripture commentaries that promise to make your scripture study easier, it's time to dig a little bit deeper. Latter-day Saint philosopher James E. Faulkner has written the Made Harder Scripture Study series on the premise that our scripture study is only as good as the questions we bring to the table. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University has already published The Book of Mormon Made Harder, The Doctrine and Covenants Made Harder, and The Old Testament Made Harder, and this May, The New Testament Made Harder will finally be available. Each book is filled with challenging questions with occasional commentary to make reading harder, or rather, more fresh and surprising and and demanding. These made harder books are an excellent tool to improve your personal or family scripture study, sacrament meeting talks, or Sunday school lessons. Watch for the New Testament Made Harder by James E. Faulkner this May. It'll be available for pre-order soon at Amazon.com. So much of modern life is geared to finding faster and easier ways to do the same old things. The Made Harder series is proof that making things easier does not always make them better. We're back with Martin E. Marty. He's a professor emeritus of religious history at the University of Chicago, and he recently contributed a volume to Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Books series on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison. I wanted to conclude by talking about what it's like to write a biography of a book. Uh, This is the series from Princeton, uh, these multiple biographies. Uh, You spend a little bit more time talking about that analogy uh, more than other people, so I just thought it would be interesting to hear some of your thoughts on what it means to write a biography of a book instead of a person. Okay, Um, you can write a biography of a book if you like it a lot or if you hate it a lot. (laughs) But but what you're doing is you're really taking it as a living thing. Bios, biology, biography, is something that's living. And the biography of a book, therefore, you have to treat it as alive somehow. Um, which means, I think I put in there, we, we can't talk about death. Usually a biography is birth to death. We don't have death here, but you have birth. And you and I have spent a lot of time in a session discussing what Baker did to bring together these scraps of letters and papers from prison. And then formulating it. And uh, there's a kind of a precast character to it. He envisions what it's going to be like. Today, that's changing greatly with the uh, internet and all the other ways of communicating. Many people now don't conceive of their writing ever taking printed form for dissemination. But the biography of a book, it becomes an object and you dissect it. And just as you deal with a life, we did we deal with Bonhoeffer's a person's life. I had to be very careful not to make too much of the book, the story of his life. It comes up all the time, but it had to be incidental because we're only interested in the book, the gestation. I didn't play games with with the biological sequence, but it didn't have an adolescence and a senility and so on along the way. But but reception, because we are, not only we are by nature, we are by nurture, we are by uh, the geography, the people we live with, etc. And um, decisive experiences. An abused child is never going to look at the uh, adult world quite as carefreely as somebody who's had loving care along the way. Uh, somebody who's been in military action where you have to kill or have been wounded is going to look at that differently. doesn't mean they're going to agree with each other, but they're going to look differently at it. And I think that, therefore, uh, they chose me uh, maybe because I wasn't a pure Bonhoeffer scholar and so many other interests. But they knew I liked, uh, again, if this was an accidental book, also by accident, I was the editor of the first English uh, collection of essays on Bonhoeffer. Uh, came, came about very accidentally, and the publisher knew that I liked this new theologian everybody's reading, and I hung out with the kind of people who read him. So I just wrote some letters, brought it together, there it was. And years later, it shows up again. People say, here's the author of the biography. I think the same thing happens here. Uh, the Bonhoeffer, you could tell by my talking, is very different in South Africa than it is in Korea, among women who are radical and women who feel perfectly content with his submissive picture of women along the way. Uh, and each of these become a part of the lore so that you can't really deal with the book without knowing some of the things that have happened to it along the way. In a way, the U.S. Constitution in the Supreme Court 
is like a biography of a book, of a short book. Uh, we know how different it is depending on which justice is appointed by whom and what their experiences are. I was on the same faculty as Chicago with Antonin Scalia and vigorously disagree with his concept of originalism because um, the Constitution has no biography in that case. Yeah, you have to look at other cases, but you act as if the way it was first stated is set that way. We well, certainly pay attention to it, just like you pay attention to whether the baby was born without an arm or whatever. But uh, originalism, I once had lunch with him when he was to speak at Chicago in a small group, my dean and I and a couple of students, and um, he was criticizing our, our divinity school loves hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, the word for uh, interpretation, and stresses the role of the interpreter. And uh, Justice Scalia was opposed to that along the way. It's just originalism. And I played a little game with him and said, uh, we're old enough to have written love letters. Well, if you write a love letter to uh, your girlfriend or boyfriend or fiancé, how long between the time the mail was delivered, back when they delivered mail, and the phone time you got a phone call. Why? Because you know you're going to get a call to say, how could you have said that? Well, that was yesterday. Today is today. Or, uh, well, maybe I wasn't real clear on it. Or uh, whatever. It's a living document. And I treat books that way. So that when Bonhoeffer went to press thanks to Baker's thing, it became a different book. Once Humphrey Miller wrote a communist version, uh, once the British uh, had this man for others, once American evangelicals write it, they loved Bonhoeffer uh, with an American evangelical spin on it, but they're going to read him differently too than somebody on the radical side. And that's what life is supposed to be, in a, an unending, back to David Tracy, conversation. So it's been 70 years uh, this month, um, April, uh, 2015 has been 70 years since Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed. What kind of uh, personal thoughts do you have uh, so many years after his death about Dietrich the man and about the work that he left for people to consider? Dietrich the man I wish I had met. Um, I've used the word sunny disposition, which isn't really in all respects the case, but his choices in music Choice of poetry in all but one instance, as I've said. His, his, his love of, of good food, good meal. Some people even thought of him as kind of a dandy. You know, it's upper middle class along the way. Uh, but the fact that he could then transcend that right away uh, makes him a figure I'd like to have known. Had he just lived out a normal, natural life, we don't know which of these thoughts would have come. But... Um, if I had to pick one of his books, it would be uh, Cost of Discipleship, because I think he taught, well, I'm, I'm in a Bible class at my own church, and we have 15, 20 different people there, in which they have to apply each page to their lives, and I can't get over the difference that the lives of the people around that table have. Uh, not all books would do that. Bonhoeffer's first two books are dead, lead, dead, dead, dead. There's good stuff in them, and I've been strongly influenced by some concepts. Uh, Sanctorum Communio is uh, central to one of my themes I get from Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer says, Christus existiert als Gemeinde. Christ exists as gathering, not in gathering. And therefore, uh, the living people are, are, are the embodiment of Christ. That goes back to the Apostle Paul, who said the church was the body of Christ, mm -hmm. and he was head. So I get that from such a book. But his first book, Sign, he's really proving to the profs that he was the smartest a German theologian should be. And it wouldn't be any in the list of my top 100 books. But Cost of Discipleship and uh, Christology, and then Letters and Papers in Prison. Uh, and they, to me, almost embody him. So I think when I read them, I think I'm in his presence. That's Martin E. Marty. He's a professor emeritus of religious history at the University of Chicago. He's an acclaimed author and religious historian. He's authored more than 50 books. Uh, the latest includes this biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison. For 
Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer with us. I enjoyed revisiting the scene. Thank you.